morning. Boy, it's a hot one outside, right? <laughs> Feel the heat. Thankful, yes. Thankful it's somewhat cool in here. If it gets too hot, I'll throw the coat off, okay? This morning's text is going to, and the title for us today is Shepherd the Flock of God. Membership matters. Membership in a local body matters. Today we're going to look at one of the main reasons every believer should be a part of a local church, an active part of a local church. We're going to examine the role of pastors in the local church body. This application of the passage begins with myself and with the other elders first. We understand these passages. Passages, honestly, that bring me to my knees. This is one of them. It's a very, very important task that we have. We want you to know, church, the elders, and myself, if there is ever any issue you have with us, we are available to talk. Please come speak to us. We take it very serious what we do. We want to hear from you. We are only humans, and we have areas we can all improve on. We take this role very seriously. This does not mean that we are able to make other sheep treat you like you want to be treated, but we are willing to hear anything we need to work on and what the church needs to work on. And it is important for everybody to know that we are not the chief shepherd. We ultimately are not able to change hearts. We can't make people love one another. However, we want unity in this body. Unity starts with open lines of communication. And good shepherds know their sheep. We know who you are and what you're about. And sheep need to be shepherded. And that's why the Word of God tells us to shepherd the flock of God. To review briefly, Peter's in the midst of explaining what our relationship with Christ should look like, lived out. Who we know and what we have in Christ should motivate us to obedience. In chapter 4, we saw that Peter gave three characteristics of a God-glorifying Christian in light of the imminent return of Christ, that we must be sober-minded prayer warriors in verse 7 of chapter 4, and that we must be committed servants of one another, loving one another, as verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4 talk about. And then third, we saw that we must be faithful stewards of God's gifts, found in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 4. Then Peter begins to explain what suffering is all about in the Christian's life. He concludes that section with an explanation of how suffering is a refining opportunity of God. It's a necessary trial for all believers to experience. All of us experience trials, and all of them are for our good, and all of them are for God's glory, so that we will know and enjoy Christ through all circumstances. Peter exhorted, we saw last week, that believers do not be surprised by trials. We shouldn't be surprised by these trials when they come. We must, in fact, sh rejoice in sharing in the sufferings of Christ. When we go through trials, we must understand that we are, to a small degree, suffering with Christ. Third, we saw that we do not suffer for doing unrighteousness. We shouldn't suffer for doing unrighteousness. But, in fact... We should also suffer to glorify God and honor God through our trials. Recognizing the time that now the, the judgment has started on the house of God, that is on the church, that God is refining us right now. We must understand that that's what we're in, the time. And finally, we saw last week that we must entrust our souls to a faithful creator to endure these trials. In light of the persecution and trials this fledgling church was going through when Peter was writing, there was a real need for biblical leadership. 
This is why Peter ties the next section to the suffering church. Notice it starts with the word, therefore. Therefore is therefore a reason. The church is experiencing a time of testing and trials. Therefore, biblical leadership is imperative. In order to survive through times of trials, sheep need shepherds to help them. Sheep are going to be tested, therefore there is a need of shepherding. The primary command in the passage is shepherd the flock of God. That's what will be our focus today. We will dig, on, dig in on exactly what that word or that concept or that imperative is all about in a minute. But for now, Peter is calling the leaders of the church to care for believers. That's what he's saying. We will examine this passage and we'll see that there are four features of, an, of, the, of the appeal to shepherd the flock of God among you. Let's look at them briefly. The recipients of the appeal, the pastor of the appeal, the substance of the appeal, and the reward of the appeal. Let's start with the recipients of the appeal. Look in verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder... And then it's mentioned in chapter two or chapter five, verse two, shepherd the flock of God among you. Who are the recipients of the appeal? They were the elders of the churches in that area, or the shepherds of the local church that Peter was writing to. Elders is a term that is referred to numerous times in the New Testament. The term elder is synonymous with overseer or bishop in the scriptures. Those two those terms are kind of interchangeable. The church leadership is always described as a plurality. Always described as a plurality. Maybe, maybe some of you have come from churches where one guy ran the show and then everybody else kind of looked at him and bowed to him and did whatever he said to do. Well, that's not how scripture describes the leadership of a local body. It should be a plurality of leaders, a plurality of elders. We will deal with this actual command again in a minute, but however, I want you to notice the command implies a specific identity of those who are addressed, and that is we are shepherds. Shepherds are the only ones who shepherd the flock of God. So what are shepherds? We all know, right? You basically know what a shepherd is. The title shepherd is obviously or is associated with our English word pastor. So if you were asking me what would be my favorite title for the role that we have as elders, I would say it is pastor because it's associated with shepherding. Um, many people like to be called the preacher man or the preacher. I personally just want to be called a pastor, uh, short for P. Mike. That's what everybody calls me. Shepherd is a title that uses the sheep and shepherding imagery to explain the roles of the church members and the leaders within the church and how they interact. The imagery suggests God associates with believers as sheep. He associates those two. Believers are sheep. And the task of the elder or the overseer is similar to shepherding a flock of sheep. So why does the Bible use this uh, imagery of sheep for believers and compare believers to sheep? Why? Well, actually, if you look in the Bible itself, it tells you why God uses sheep to compare us as believers. The Bible itself. In other words, I don't have to do a giant study of sheep and shepherds to figure out why God's saying this. That was the context. But throughout the Bible, the Bible uses that imagery, and in the context of using the imagery, it tells you some of the features of sheep. For example, if you've got your Bibles, here we go. We'll, we'll flip through a few of these. Sheep are these, and I want you to understand. Sheep get lost easily. Sheep get lost easily. This is why shepherds need to shepherd the flock of God. Sheep get lost because Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his 
own way. What's the concept? Real simple. We go astray. Believers go astray. Matthew 10, 6 states this, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus telling them, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They stray. We get lost easily. That's what believers do. How about this one? Psalm 119, 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. That is, we go astray. Also, sheep are vulnerable to being led astray. Sheep are vulnerable to be being led astray. For example, in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You understand, folks, this is who we are. We are sheep that are vulnerable of being led astray. We saw this back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were continually straying like sheep. This is who we are. Also, sheep are prone to worry or get distressed without care. Look at Matthew 9, 36. You can just write these down. They're all up on the board here for you because I didn't want to make you flip real fast. Here we go. You ready? We see here that sheep are prone to worry or get distressed. Jesus said, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So this is what sheep do. We worry. We get distressed. Jesus saw it and said they need a shepherd. Then in John chapter 10, verse 4, we see sheep will, will follow their leader or their shepherd. It says in John 10, 4, when he put forth his, all his own, he goes ahead of him, talking about the shepherd, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Sheep follow shepherds. Then also we see that sheep need constant attention. Matthew 26, 31, then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, talking right before his uh, crucifixion, and his arrest, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Without a shepherd, sheep need constant attention. Without a shepherd, we will stray, and we will get off track, and we will scatter. So sheep can't do this by themselves. We need a shepherd. We know this from Psalm 23 too, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. We can't provide for ourselves, sheep. That's what God is saying about this metaphor. And this is why he uses this imagery. Sheep also need protection. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. And finally, we know sheep flock together with goats but however goats have a tendency to be a little different than sheep and that is goats ha are more independent and they don't always want to flock together but for some reason sheep and goats hang out together a lot sheep like to be in the flock goats get in there and want to do things their own way they get in there so one day what's going to happen God is going to separate the sheep from the goats those that are sheep are his those that are goats are not his and he will show the difference so sheep need a shepherd again as we saw in first peter chapter 2 verse 25 that our at our salvation we return to god as our chief guardian and shepherd for you were continually straying like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. So who is your primary shepherd? It's Jesus Christ. However, we are called, elders are called to be the under shepherds, those that help him and shepherd his flock. Our return is the effect of a saving work in God. And now when we turn from our sin and trust in Christ, we have a shepherd and it is Jesus Christ. So Peter is addressing these elders 
And he also calls them shep- uh, elders and overseers and also shepherds. It's very important to note, every shepherd is also what? A sheep. Yeah, we are all sheep, even the shepherds. So it's kind of strange. We're in, uh, we're in a very difficult paradox here. The metaphors often mi- mix for me. I speak as a shepherd, but also I understand that often I'm speaking to myself as what? A sheep. Why does that happen? Well, because we haven't arrived, right? We're not in glory. No elder is. We're still sheep. Peter addressed the elders and called them to shepherd, but obviously they were part of those he addressed in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. So they had returned to the shepherd and guardian of their soul. They were associated with sheep returning to their shepherd. Every shepherd is also a sheep. This is one of the greatest challenges of shepherding, beloved. We are both shepherds and sheep. We must constantly be teachable and humble to our chief shepherd and his word. But also we are called to lead as under shepherds of his flock. So first we see the recipient of the appeal are the elders or the under shepherds. Second we see the shepherd of the appeal. Look at Peter here. Wow. He gets in and gives you a glimpse into his heart. Notice in chapter 1 verse 1 or chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. So who's the shepherd of the appeal? Well, Peter is the shepherd of the appeal. The shepherd who makes the appeal is the apostle Peter himself. And Peter gives us a glimpse into what a shepherd looks like. And this is really good because if you were if you were to explain what a shepherd looks like, I, I don't know if I would be the perfect example. Let's look at somebody a little better. <laughs> and that would be the Apostle Peter. He gives us a threefold revelation of himself in this passage. A threefold revelation of himself. Notice the identification provides both a, a gentle authority and credence to his exhortation. Peter is exhorting or shepherding. Guess who he's shepherding? He's shepherding the sheep shepherds. Now, that's getting real confusing, isn't it? He's shepherding the shepherds. He gives them a glimpse into his own heart as he encourages them to shepherd the flock of God. This is beautiful, beloved. Oh, if you want to know how to parent, you know, want to know how to be a leader in your home, you want to know how to do anything, take a look at this passage and apply it. It's beautiful. Notice first... Peter states this, he is a fellow elder. Now, at first, when you see that, you say, well, was he an elder of a church somewhere? Well, I believe he's talking about the idea that he is on the same plane as them. He's a fellow elder, an elder along with others, as church leaders, possessing authority and dignity in common. Even though Peter is an apostle, He marks himself out as a fellow elder. When he's talking to elders, he says, I'm with you. I'm a fellow elder. Why is that important? Well, because this is one of the primary, and mark this, listen closely, one of the primary characteristics of a genuine shepherd. He doesn't consider himself as better than others or more important than them. Do you hear me? He says, I'm a fellow elder, which implies what? I'm just like you. I'm one of you. Do you see how all this works together beautifully? A shepherd knows the love of Christ and thus loves Christ and loves others and puts others above himself. Boy, convicting words, right, elders? Painful things for us to think on. Peter, by saying a fellow fellow elder, puts himself on the same plane as other elders. Think about it. If he was talking to him, what could he have done? He could have said, hey, listen up. I'm the apostle P. 
Peter. <laughs> Shepherd the flock of God. What would that be? That would be lording his position over them. But what in fact he does is what? He says, I'm with you. I'm one of you. Boy, just, just apply that just for a second, men, to your home. Oh, you're trying to shepherd your house. <laughs> you're trying to shepherd your wife. You're trying to shepherd your, your children. And you turn around and you say, I'm the husband. You're the wife. That's not putting yourself where they are. That's putting yourself above them. Calling out your badge, for, for lack of a better term. A shepherd sees himself on the same plane as those that he's shepherding. Here is a humble way of saying, I'm one of you. Yes, we are what? Sheep shepherds. We are just like you. What a stark contrast from arguing who is the greatest. Remember the Apostle Peter? Before, he was arguing who's the greatest. And they were arguing amongst them. Who's the greatest? And do you remember his prideful statement before his fall? What was it? Though all leave you, I will not fall away. I will do it. I will die for you, even if everybody falls away. But Peter's learned something, hasn't he? He's no longer saying, I'm the greatest. He's now saying what? I'm like you. I'm one of you. He no longer pridefully elevates himself above others. He actually considers others before himself. You want to be an elder. Some of you in the room aspire to be an elder. Do people look at you and say, that guy puts me above himself? Or do they say, that guy is all about himself and his opinion? Look at Peter. This is what it means to be an elder. The shepherd who is shepherding the sheep says, I'm one of you, a fellow elder. Peter has gotten Jesus' message now, hasn't he? Matthew 23, 10. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader. That is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Yet Peter also knows their role, for he is a fellow elder. And elders must lead. Next, notice that Peter reveals he is a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Oh, beloved, mark this. This is a major theme of the Bible. This is a major theme, especially of Peter's letter. A major theme of Peter's life. The cross must have had an unforgettable impression on Peter. You want to know somebody that's a great elder? It's a person that's been humbled by the glory of the cross. It's somebody that knows just how much their sin costs the Savior. It's the one that says, Wow, I get the cross. I get what he's done for me. Peter witnessed it. You think this was the worst and best moment of Peter's life? That moment when he saw Christ dying on a cross for him? Where he witnessed it? It was the day he watched Jesus brutally beaten. It was the day that he rejected Christ three times, denied him three times as he was being beaten. It was the day that Jesus took the wrath of God for Peter's sin. And Peter watched it. Most likely Luke 23, 49 alludes to this. Most suggest that Peter watched the crucifixion from a distance. Seeing Jesus die for his own sin. Do you think it made an impact on Jesus? Oh, it was a huge impact. He understood how much Christ loved him. And no longer was there room for pride. See, that's what a, 
A genuine shepherd does. It's a shepherd that understands the chief shepherd and what the chief shepherd has done for us. That he died in our place. Didn't he allude to that? Look. Remember, verse 21 of chapter 2. Look at it again. This is Peter speaking. He knows exactly what happened. He knows the glory of the cross. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps, who committed no sin nor writs any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Oh, the cross was central in his thinking. It was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Beloved, we must understand, deep in the heart of every genuine shepherd is a full awareness and appreciation of the cross of Christ. Peter had an indelible vision of Jesus' death for him. We all need this indelible understanding of the cross of Christ. Shepherds need it. Sheep need it. It is our job to share this profound glory with everyone. So that we too will be humbled by it and trust in Him. Oh folks, listen. You want to know whether somebody is a genuine shepherd to follow. Whether these are shepherds to follow in our church or elders to follow in our church. Ask them about the cross. Ask them about the gospel. Ask them how much Christ means to them. And what He's done for them. Beloved, do you understand? This is not my natural inclination. I don't want to get up here and talk about this. This isn't the first thing my flesh says. This is scary stuff. I'm speaking the word of God. And if I get it wrong, guess who I'm going to stand before? God. I'm frightful of what I'm doing. But why do we do it? (laughs) We do it because of what Christ did for us. We know he loves us. To preach the word of God is an enormous responsibility. But our love for Christ and our understanding of what he's done for us implores us to do it. Finally, we see Peter calls the pastors to be partakers or explains the pastors that he's a partaker of the glory that is about to be revealed. Peter is well aware of the imminent return of Christ. Peter has a clear focus on the glory to come. He knows that his life is short and that Christ is coming and he needs to keep his eyes on that eschatological thinking, that end times thinking. He must see the future as the most important thing. Not here, but final future. As the shepherd pastors the shepherds to shepherd the flock of God. He reveals his focus is all about eternity and about the glory to come. Beloved, this is what Peter had exhorted the believers previously to think on in light of their own suffering. And I think it's, it's important for us to understand as shepherds, anybody that's shepherding, we must see the end game more than about now. If it's all about now, if it's all about getting rich, it's all about two cars, a two-car garage, and 2.5 kids, you're probably not ready to be a shepherd. Do you understand? Shepherds must have an eternal perspective. They can't worry about the day-to-day things. It can't be about getting rich, as we'll see in a little bit. Peter wasn't. He was focused on what? The cross, and he was focused on eternity. Those are the things that drove him. That's what made him implore them to do something, to shepherd the flock of God. Humbled by the cross, 
motivated by the coming glory of Christ. Peter encourages the elders. He says, I exhort you, the elders among you. I call the elders alongside of me. Shepherd the flock of God. So what is the application for us? Well, we can learn a lot from the way Peter deals with people here, right? He's humble. He's encouraging in his exhortation. No, we might not all be elders, but everyone should be shepherding someone. All of us should be shepherding someone. These characteristics revealed in Peter are crucial for our success. We can be 100% right and deliver our message wrong, and the truth of the message will be ignored. You hear me? Peter could have, with pride, says, Hey, I'm an apostle. Listen to me. Shepherd the flock of God. And he would have missed the whole point. But by the grace of God, the Spirit was working in him. He was humble. It was about the cross. It was about eternity. And he says, I'm one of you. Shepherd the flock of God. The motive of your heart as you shepherd is probably the most important thing to shepherding people. We also must be careful to place our exhortation in proper context if we want to accept them. If, they wanna, if we want our people to accept what we say, we must be humble, Christ-exalting, not self-exalting. And eschatological in focus. I'm telling you, being a shepherd, one of the hardest things is, and I admit it, being a pastor, one of the hardest things is, there's two camps. There's those that think you're better than you really are. Right? Those that think you're better than you really are. And those that think you're worse than you really are. And those two camps are always attacking you. Okay? There's the... Better than you think you are. Man, that was great. That was your best one ever. Way to go. And then there's the others. You missed it again, Pastor. You're off. Just a little bit. What about this over here? You know what those two camps do for a pastor? They're our test. See, if it's about exalting me then your opinion matters too much. If it's about exalting Christ, God's opinion is the only one that really matters. So does that mean you shouldn't encourage your pastor? No, because I'm a sheep still. But at the same time, we must understand what? God's opinion is the only one that really matters. We must be humble, Christ-exalting, and eschatological in focus. Often people don't accept our exhortations because we come off as arrogant or self-focused. And again, folks, when I stand up and say, Thus says the Lord, I don't know about you guys, but the tendency for us is to what? He thinks he's speaking for the Lord? Well, again, I want you to understand, only as long as we stay true to the Scriptures. When we speak what it says, and we apply the way it applies, then thus says the Lord. If it's us, then yeah, chuck it. But beloved, we must understand as shepherds, anybody that's shepherding, that we must speak the utterances of God. We must speak the words of God. And the authority is found in it, not us. Do you understand? Peter blew it many times, didn't he? We know it, especially in his first three years of walking with Jesus. But here we see a mature shepherd, a humble man who exalts Christ and understands the future is what matters. We aren't ready to shepherd into anyone until we love others more than ourselves. We love Christ because what he did for us. And we have an eternal perspective that dwarfs any temporary pleasures of this world. So we've seen the recipients of the appeal, the shepherd or pastor who is making the appeal. Now we turn to the specific 
substance of the appeal. Look in verses 2 and 3. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example to the flock. Man, talk about two verses that should humble anybody aspiring to the office of elder. Shepherd the flock of God. Act like a shepherd. Tend the flock. It encompasses all that is entitled with shepherding or pastoring a church. Protecting them from the enemies of the flock. Providing food for their nourishment, the word of God. Caring for their well-being through thoroughly and through all kinds of trials. Disciplining for repeated straying. Leading toward green pastures and the glory to come. Pointing to the chief shepherd. This is what shepherding is. That's what we're about. The shepherd's duties include exercising oversight is what it says. God has by his great mercy placed elders in the flock to exercise oversight. This is not because he is forcing people to submit to other people but rather because he has ordained these men to help us and protect us. It is the elders that oversight, that are exercising oversight. Just as parents do it for their children, and listen to me, folks, our, con our, 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 our culture goes totally against this. Our culture hates authority. We are our own authority in our culture, right? Right? Oversight is not necessary in our society. We are our own kings. Isn't that the way it is? We're all independent, autonomous. We do what we want to do, people. That's what our culture says. But Scripture says the opposite. Scripture says we need authority. We need authorities over us. God wants us to submit to authorities in our life. That he's placed over us. Again, if I'm preaching this, if I'm preaching anything other than scripture, throw it out. And it almost sounds what? Self exalting. <laughs> because, in a sense, I'm saying, what am I saying to you? You need to submit to us. <laughs> That's, how can I say that? Well, because it's not my authority, it's what the scriptures say. It's not about me. It's about Christ Jesus, our Lord. Elders have this enormous responsibility to exercise oversight of the flock of God. I'll tell you, folks, as I was thinking through and meditating on this passage all week, I have been brought to my knees in utter fear. Oh, God, I need you. As I was walking up on the stage, I was saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit, just like Spurgeon did. I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's only by His grace that we can do this. It's an enormous responsibility. The weight, the burden at times. Y'all wonder why Mondays are really tough for me? It's like everything crashes down. And all I can think about is the sheep that weren't there. Do you understand it? My soul, you wonder why I text you on Monday. It's because my soul aches for you. Every single one of you, I think about you, I pray for you, we're praying for you. You're always on our hearts. An enormous burden. We know we have this responsibility, this duty to shepherd the flock of God among you. But isn't this interesting? While it does not exclude providing truth to others outside the local church, it does emphasize our primary responsibility is to who? Those among you. Those in this group. It is the local congregation of God's own. The flock among you. This is why, and I love you guys, I'm not telling you stop listening to John MacArthur on the radio. Or John Piper on podcast. But they're not really your shepherds. They're not your pastors. 
Those are men preaching the word of God. Praise God. But they have their flock. Being a member of a local body is imperative. And being an active member. Shepherding involves more than just listening to sermons on an internet. It involves knowing and interacting with the sheep and having the shepherds pray for the sheep. You know, the Lord wakes me up at night at times. I, 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 just, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, so-and-so wasn't there Sunday. I hope they're okay. Oh, God, protect them. Help them know the importance of your word. Bring them back to us, Lord. We are obviously supposed to be doing the work of an evangelist. But the primary job of the shepherds is to take care of the flock. You guys. Beloved, the elders of Grace Bible Church have a responsibility to shepherd you. Do we fail? Absolutely. We blow it many times. Again, we are just sheep. Will you please pray for us? Will you please be patient with us? Will you please communicate with us? Talk to us. Come to us. So I don't answer your phone call one time. Please don't know. Please know that I'm not ignoring you. I'm probably got somebody else sitting right in front of me or a book in front of me trying to get ready to preach the word. Harass me. It's okay. I want you to if you're hurting. If it's important, I'm available. The guys are available. Aren't we, Bob? Aren't we, Mark? Stephen? Come to us. We want to help you. Don't isolate. We know it's an important responsibility. And we, the elders, will all stand before the Lord one day with how well we do this role. If the judgment has started first with the church, who do you think the judgment starts with first within the church? I think it's the leaders. I think it's us. Hebrews 13, 17 states this, Obey your leaders, submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. How important is it to be in a church where you have shepherds that are genuine? I think it's very important. Friends, let me explain something to you. There's a great fear in every elder's heart. No, it isn't what you think of the sermon. It's what God thinks of the sermon. It's not how well I meet your felt needs. It's how well we fulfill our responsibility to meet your spiritual needs. We know that. It is the elder's prayer that we will point you to the glory of Christ by faithfully preaching the word of God and counseling you with the word of God. We want to lead you to obey all that Christ has commanded you. That's our goal. We're making disciples. Peter now turns to the motivation of the shepherd. Notice he gives three contrasts to contemplate, three sets of contrasts to contemplate for the elders. And boy, I'll tell you, I think these motives, you want to discern whether a, a pastor is legit or not, and I, I admit, this is very difficult, and only by the grace of God can we keep this. But if you want to discern if somebody's a genuine pastor, not a false prophet like those in Jeremiah that we read about, you look at these motives. You look at what they're about, what their hearts are about, and you see it. It reveals itself, right? The heart reveals what it does. <laughs> it is revealed by what it does. Notice these three sets. First, there's not with have to, but with want to. Not with have to, but want to. Not under compulsion. The term means literally necessarily or by constraint. It implies that the work of the shepherd must not be forced or drudgery for them. 
This pertains to being obligatory, on the basis of being imposed, out of obligation, or ought to. And again, this is an attitude. How many of you, we all struggle with this, don't you? You go into work. You sometimes go to work because you have to, or do you go to work because you want to? Which one? Have to or want to? <laughs> Pastors are required, elders are required to always do their job because they want to, not because they have to. That's a heart, right? That's a heart issue. Friends, you can help us with this. Listen to me closely. First, pray for us. We can slide back into our own self-righteous works mentality too. We can begin to think, oh, i got to do this. I'm getting paid. That's not it, ever. Please help us also. Second, as the author of Hebrews states, Obey your leaders and submit to them in order that they do this with joy, not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. Do you hear that? Oh, please, beloved. <laughs> Help us to do this job with joy. <laughs> do you understand if you're, if, if, if you're sitting there on Monday morning and you get a text that says, Somebody said something about you. What do you say to that? Do you think that's going to make us go, Oh, this is great! Let me do this some more. Oh, I have to admit to you. You want to know the one thing that absolutely destroys every pastor. You ready? Gossip about the pastor. That's it. Gossip about the pastor. When you hear that somebody else has a problem with you from somebody else, instead of the other person coming to them, that makes us, it, it hurts. <laughs> because we take this job serious. And if we think, if we think that we're not honoring the Lord by doing this, it kills us. If you have a problem, do this. You ready? Come to us. Please. Now I admit, I admit, it's ultimately about what God thinks. So if you, I'm not always going to agree. We're not always going to agree with everything, right? But please, beloved, help us want to do the job. That's our responsibility to be humble to God, right? I can't blame it on you. If there's a bunch of grumbling and complaining about me behind my back, and I don't know it, I'm still required to do it with want to. Do you hear me? I can't say, well, these sheep, they make my job impossible. I'm just going to have to do it. It doesn't work that way. I still have to want to do it. Which means no matter how bad you attack us, I still have to fall on my knees and say, God, change my heart and help me to do it with love. But at the same time, you sure could make it a little easier <laughs> if you just talk to us. Because then we won't do it under compulsion, but we'll do it voluntarily, willingly, with joyful hearts, according to the will of God. Second, not for money, but with eager, with eager joy. Not for sordid gain. That is, it's not about what? Getting rich at any cost. Pastors aren't in it for the loot. Do you hear me? We're not in it for money. We don't need fast cars, flashy houses, and jets. And if you need a jet, and you need fast cars and expensive houses, then maybe you're not a pastor. This doesn't mean we shouldn't get paid. Did you hear me? <laughs> it means we just need to survive. We're okay with just getting our basic needs met. We don't want to be rich. That is not our theme song. If it, if it is, I want to be rich 
than it's for sordid gain. But not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Carries the idea of readily, joyful, consistent in feeding the flock and not in salary. Consistent in, not, in feeding the flock, but not in salary, as one commentator stated. The church leaders of that day probably did receive a salary, but they didn't pastor for the pay primarily, and we don't. Shepherds should serve willingly and eagerly. And finally, we see not lording over people, but by being an example. Ooh. Here we go. You ready? One of the biggest problems with leadership is power often corrupts. Are you hearing me? It corrupts. The world's leaders rule by manipulation, corruption, and deception. That's all of the world's leaders. Do you understand? That's what world leaders do. That's how they rule. And if they have enough power, brutality is right behind it. They'll kill you if you don't do what they say. But shepherds of God's flock must be different. And this isn't just about physical. And it's not just about political. It's about heart issues and manipulating people. Pastors must never manipulate people, ever. We are servant leaders. We are leaders that must die to self constantly. The term here, lording it over, denotes hostility and pride. It can have the sense of ruling by domination. This word carries the idea of oppression. Lord it over is using one's power to subjugate others and exalt himself. We can't be that way. The elders must not be that way. And by the way, in your shepherding your children and in your shepherding people at work, you can't be that way either. We must be different. It should be noted that such a domineering attitude would be in stark contrast with the attitude the Lord Jesus evidenced. There's a sense where authority is in view, but it is authority with humility. That's crucial. That little phrase, allotted to your charge, brings with it the huge responsibility. God's providential allotment of the flock to each elder. We will give an account. This is why the pastorate is not something anyone should take lightly. This is why for approximately 12 years, the Apostle Paul was mostly studying. Paul took his calling seriously. Contrary to popular opinion, pastors don't work one day a week. You know that, right? We study. We prepare for various messages. We disciple continuously. We take phone calls at all hours of the night. And we do all this and we don't lord it over you. I know this is a, the, the irony of this message is, is here. I could be accused of that, couldn't I? That's the great thing about expository preaching verse by verse through the Bible. You know I didn't have an agenda. <laughs> I didn't pick this passage out and say, I'm going to get these people to do what I want them to do. We just preach the next verse. And the verse tells us what we should do. We must be an example. We all know this. This term literally means an, impressions left, an impression left by a stroke, alluding to the impression of a coin, a pattern, a model, which casts for others to copy. As a small-scale form designed to be copied or modeled or, or followed, be an example to the flock. Isn't it, this is shocking, isn't it, Mark? I mean, I don't know about you, but the, again, I'm just humbled by this. You're supposed to look at me and my family. You're supposed to look at us. Now, just a side note on that. Be careful, because my kids aren't the shepherds. Do you understand? And my wife is not the shepherd either. Do you understand? I'm the shepherd, Okay? And I'm here, and we live in a glass house, and I get it. This is overwhelming at times. I have 150, 200 people looking at me and saying, I want to 
I must follow your example. If that won't bring you to your knees, nothing will. Grudem states this, Thus all in leadership positions in the church should realize that the requirement to live a life worthy of imitation is not optional. It is a major part of the job, challenging though such responsibility may be. We must be an example to the flock. So how do we do this? We do it by the grace of God who works within us. The same God that transformed Peter is the same God that will transform us. Will you pray for us, please? (laughs) Will you help us, please? Help us by valuing the things that really matter. Help us by valuing the Word of God. That's the thing that's going to transform your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. Lord, we are humbled. The elders, I know, we're all humbled by this calling. We pray that you will help us to exercise oversight over this flock. We pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in here that is not a part of your flock yet, we pray that you will work in their hearts and call them to them to yourself and have them repent of their sins and trust in you. Though there are a lot of people in here, Lord, we know that there, there are probably some in this room that don't know you as their Savior and Lord. We pray, Father, that you will grant repentance Help them to see that they need to return to the shepherd and guardian of their soul, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross to pay for their sin. Please, God, help them to turn from their sin and trust in you and become a part of this flock. Help us, Father, now as we go to follow your word, to obey your word, because thus says the Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.